early hours of a September morning, a murder squad set out to kill a young Catholic family. But yards from their target, they were intercepted by police. Their murder bid foiled by an informer at the heart of the UVF. He was, shall we say, the perfect agent, and he was well run. And the police were grateful for the information that he gave. The man who recruited and ran the UVF informer is retired detective Trevor McElrath. He has won over a dozen commendations for bravery. He fought terrorism for over 20 years and helped secure convictions against Johnny Adair and Ken Barrett, the killer of solicitor Pat Finucane. Tonight, Michael Rath speaks exclusively about the man he groomed as his perfect agent, only to discover that he was running a killer. It makes me physically sick to think that I was sitting in a car, paying somebody tens of thousands of pounds to tell us who's doing all the murders, to find out that it's him that's doing all the murders. Michael Rath's rogue agent is now at the centre of an ombudsman investigation into allegations that police allowed loyalist informers to kill with impunity for over a decade. I viewed him as a psychopath. He enjoyed killing. Trevor Michael Rath was working as a CID officer in Greencastle when he first encountered the 17-year-old who was to become one of his top agents. I charged him with burglaries and petrol bomb on a bus. I spoke for him at the court because I believed that every young lad deserves a chance. Within weeks, Trevor Michael Rath had enrolled the teenager in adult literacy classes. He also brought him to football tournaments organised by community police. But he says the teenager was soon to become embroiled in more sinister activities. One night I was out on patrol on my own and he flashed me with the headlights and I stopped the car and talked to him and he noticed that he was really, really nervous. Now this was a guy who was normally a bubbly character, full of fun, laughing, joking. He had completely changed. He was, he, there was something wrong with him. He was afraid of something. So that night, he told me that he had joined the UVF. Although Trevor Michael Rath was unable to persuade the teenager to leave the UVF, he said he did succeed in signing him up as a loyalist informer. He took the choice. He got into a car with us willingly, not under any pressure, not having any bribes or blackmail or anything like that, because we wouldn't operate it like that. He was there because he wanted to be there. We told him how he could help the police, how he could save lives, and how he could help the community. And he took us up on the offer. For legal reasons, we cannot name agent number 201240. We will call him Agent Alice. By 1991, the UVF decided that Agent Alice should take part in a murder bid, but in fact, he went on to save the lives of a Catholic family. This would be known as Ballyduff Bray. This is where the police intercepted three gunmen on their way to murder a Catholic family. It was information that was provided by him. Agent as he was known. They were armed. He gave us details of the car they were going to use and the people who were in the car. He provided all those details. Agent Alice had scored his first real success as an informer. 
three of his uvf associates from mount vernon were charged and later imprisoned for intent to endanger life shortly afterwards one of those men colin caldwell was murdered by the ira in prison agent alice had hijacked the car used in the ballyduff murder bid but he was never questioned by police the young loyalist had saved lives and his handler was convinced that he would abide by the rules there was a line you didn't ever step over and not he never broke the law or hurt anybody. He kept the police fully informed of everything you were doing. At that stage, was there anything to suggest that your agent was breaking the rules? Nothing whatsoever. After the Ballyduff Bray success, Special Branch started to run Agent Alice jointly with CID. From then on, they were meeting him regularly. What do you think? motivation was for handing over information? At the start, it was to help. Then I think he started enjoying being an agent and the adrenaline rush that went with that. With each meeting, Michael Rath says his young agent grew more confident. He seen that he could meet us. Nothing was happening to him. He was able to provide good information and was paid well for it. In 1992, the UVF again asked Agent Alice to take part in a murder bid and again he gave his handler vital information. This is a street that he drove down in a van in an attempt to kill a Catholic man working in a garage. As he got to the garage, undercover police jumped on him and put him to the ground and arrested him. He was the informant who gave us the information about that attempted murder. So in actual fact, he saved the man's life a UVF man was jailed for his part in the operation, but Agent Alice was cleared of all charges, despite the fact that he had been the driver. Michael Rath says that was because he was a valuable informer whom police wanted to protect. He couldn't see, seem to be the only one that got away. The, the gunman was caught, he was a driver, so he was caught too. He spent... I can't remember whether it was six or nine months on remand, and then one day the charges were withdrawn or dropped by the Director of Public Prosecution. But from the moment he got into the murder car, he was never going to be prosecuted for that murder bid? No. Because he was an informer? Correct. At this time, Michael Rath was running around 30 informers in North Belfast, both Loyalist and Republican. He says many of them did not receive money for information. However, Agent Alice was being amply rewarded. Money would have exchanged hands usually after the meeting was over. He, he was being paid a retainer, plus if he brought in good information, then he would get more money. How much would he have been paid? After well, that depending meeting. on the information, uh, uh, if it was to save somebody's life, which it was, um, he would have been paid tens of thousands of pounds. By the age of 22, Agent Alice had foiled two UVF murder bids and helped police put four of his associates in jail. But with each life he saved, he increased the risk of being exposed as an informer. His handler says he was terrified, convinced that at any moment the UVF would discover his treachery. He'd been asked by his UVF bosses that tomorrow morning we need you early in the morning and you're to bring a spade with you. And he, being paranoid, believed that he was going to be digging his own grave and then they would shoot him and bury him in it. But in actual fact, what was happening, they were going to dig up guns, but at that time he believed he was so much under suspicion that the spade was for his grave and that he was going to dig in his own grave before they shot him. Mm -hmm. But we managed to calm him down enough that 
if he showed any nervousness at all, they would smell a rat. So he, he had to just go along with it. How suspicious were the UVF of utilities? Well, the new we had, the police had somebody close because the, the success we were having against them was so great. In other words, the lives we were saving. UVF suspicions were growing and they sat Agent Alice a test that they believed no police informer could ever pass. They ordered him to kill. On the 17th of January, 1993, a young Catholic woman was shot dead on the shore road. It was a brutal killing. The 27-year-old's attacker shot her in the back and when she was lying on the floor, stepped over her and shot her in the head. Sharon McKenna was known as a good Samaritan, a regular visitor to the home of an elderly Protestant man close to the UVF's North Belfast HQ. Her brother remembers a kind-hearted girl. Sharon would have been up for anything to help people out. She's just her own wee one girl charity, you know. She's always up for helping people. I mean, she wouldn't have thought for a minute somebody was going to come and murder her because of who she was and, and where she was at the time. When Sharon McKenna was killed, Michael Rass says he was immediately alarmed that his agent had not warned him about the murder. It would have been the 3rd Battalion from Mount Vernon who would have carried that out because, you know, that's their area. That's their area of operation. Had to be some of them. Why had he not told me? Shortly afterwards, Michael Rath received information that Agent Alice had been involved in the murder. Michael Rath's CID partner at the time was Detective Sergeant Johnson Brown. He has declined to be interviewed for this programme, but has told us that the evening after the killing, he went with Michael Rath to question Agent Alice unofficially by the side of the M2. There, he says Agent Alice cried like a baby and admitted that he had been the backup gunman. Your colleague, Johnson Brown, has told us that that night confessed to being the backup gunman. That is intelligence. We have to turn that into evidence and confession. So therefore, we went to our superiors and told them exactly what was said in that car. At that stage, did you believe he was telling you the truth? Absolutely. Absolutely. Following that motorway encounter, Agent Alice was arrested, along with a number of his Mount Vernon associates, and taken to Castle Ray. I questioned him for seven days, and the interview notes should reflect that. I can put my hand on my heart and say, and Detective Sergeant Brown agrees with me, that no one tried harder than I tried to put a in jail for the murder of Sharon McKenna. But today there are contradictions in Brown and Michael Rath's accounts. Johnston Brown claims that Michael Rath told him that at a later meeting where special branch officers were also present, Agent Alice admitted to actually pulling the trigger. Never at any stage when I was meeting him did he confess and bear in mind, Detective Sergeant Brown was not there. He, he wasn't in the car, I was there with the special branch. And believe me, had he said that in the car, I would have made sure that the CID authorities were made aware of that. But today, Trevor Michael Rath remains absolutely convinced that Agent Alice killed Sean McKenna. How do you know? I do know. I do know. Because other agents told us that he'd uh... Michael Rass says those agents confirmed that it was his informant who had been tested by the UVF. Were you shocked that this young man... Yes, absolutely. That you had mentored to begin with? And you absolutely had shocked. At... Uh, It took its toll on me that, you know, an agent that I had recruited, I believed, had killed somebody. 
I tried my best from then on to put him in jail for the murder of Sean McKenna. How did you do that? By the use of other informants, by trying to catch him doing things that he wasn't telling us about. Those informants, claims Michael Rath, provided information which he believed would solve the case. He says they not only identified Agent Alice as the killer, but they also gave him the name of the murder bid driver. Do you know who the driver was? Yes. I know exactly who he is. Did you tell your senior officers who yes. the driver was? Yes. And, was he and I question? wanted to interview him because I knew that he was a weak link and that if we had taken him to Castle Ray, he would have probably told us that he was the driver of the car and that the gunmen were and another. Michael Rath is convinced that he wasn't allowed to question the driver because individuals within Special Branch were determined to protect Agent Alice. He believes that the driver was also a police agent. Michael Rath says Special Branch feared he would break under interrogation, leaving both himself and their more valuable informer, Agent Alice, open to prosecution. It was the determination of individuals within Special Branch to prevent a proper investigation that convinced Michael Rath that they would protect their agents at all costs. So you were convinced at that stage that, that there was not the will on the part of the Special Branch? Absolutely they, correct. They could have gathered the evidence? Well, th that was your job. That information, says Michael Rath, was officially recorded in documents known as CID 50 forms, which were made available to both Special Branch and CID. Michael Rath is convinced that even today, if the driver was questioned, he could help secure a conviction. I believe even today, if he was interviewed, he would admit it. Why he was never interviewed, I have my own suspicions. Um, maybe other departments are protecting him, but he was never interviewed for the murder of Sharon McKenna. Sharon McKenna's brother says that if individuals within the police protected her killers from prosecution, they too must be brought to justice. These guys are, are put in a position of, of trust. They're supposed to take murderers and criminals off the streets, and instead they're keeping them on the streets to carry on what they can only do what they do best. But even after Sharon McKenna's killing, Trevor Michael Rath continued to act as Agent Alice's handler. But you continued to run him? Yes, I continued even to run you him. you knew or suspected that he had murdered this young man? For the sole purpose of trying, looking for an opportunity where I could put him in jail. He couldn't make eye contact with me in the car anymore. I found that he wouldn't speak to me as openly as he did before. It's as if he knew that I knew he had killed Sharon McKenna. It would have been the easiest thing in the world for me to say, I'm sorry, I'm not working with that agent anymore. I would have lost all contact. He would have been able to do whatever he wanted. And nobody would have stopped him. Michael Raz says that a year after the Sharon McKenna killing, his informer became officer in command of Mount Vernon UVF and now had the power to sanction murder operations. This area here would have been the main. He would have controlled this area. He would have collected the money from the racketeering scams that they had going, from building, building sites, bars, they were all paying protection money. So he was a very powerful figure in this area? Absolutely. He had the power of life and death over people. According to Michael Rath, Agent Alice was now commanding a UVF unit that had been infiltrated by four police informers, yet he says it was still able to carry out its criminal activities. The Mount Vernon UVF were different from 
other UVF units in that they just done whatever they like. They just absolutely were out of control. In May 1994, two Catholic workmen, Gary Convey and Damon Fox, were murdered. As commanding officer of Mount Vernon, Agent Alice was questioned about the double murders, but later released. In the three years that followed, Mount Vernon UVF was linked to three brutal killings. Presbyterian minister David Templeton was beaten with hammers and nail-studded clubs. He died six weeks later. Taxi driver John Harbinson was handcuffed and dumped in an alleyway in Mount Vernon. At the time, Michael Rath was running more than 15 loyalist informers in North Belfast when the UVF's third victim, Thomas Shepherd, was murdered as a suspected informer. Michael Rath says one of his other agents told him that the killer was Agent Alice. It was a carried out murder of, of Shepherd. He went as far as to say that after he'd shot him, he said uh, he really, really liked that guy because he'd stayed in his house and all at Port Rush or somewhere. And he really liked him, but he still killed him in the middle of a bar in front of people. At the time, Michael Rath says information he received about the killings was again officially recorded in documents that were available to senior officers, but he says nothing came of intelligence that could have been transformed into evidence. He was continuing to kill people and one senior policeman asked me had I no control over him which led me to believe that he knew exactly what was going on and my reply was no sir no, no, no control whatsoever. And what was his reaction? He just walked away. Michael Rass says individuals within Special Branch were prepared to protect their top agents, but that protection, he says, was not offered to informers run solely by CID. He claims that Special Branch was prepared to sacrifice his agents to protect their own. On the 3rd of March, 1997, an attempt by the UVF to bomb the Sinn Féin offices in Monaghan Town failed. The UVF had intended the bomb to go off at 9am in order to inflict maximum casualties, but it failed to detonate. According to Michael Rath, that bomb did not explode because just days earlier, Agent Alice had given it to his handlers to be made safe. He carried the bomb to Wasteland where Trevor Michael Rath and two special branch officers were waiting. I put my hand into the bag and I lifted out. It was a large coffee jar filled with this like silver putty like stuff it had a, a brown top still screwed on but there was a red light on it and it was on and I said to him is that a bomb he says yes it's a bomb I says is it armed he says I don't know I says you don't know you had no idea that he was going to bring this I bomb. had no idea he was going to bring that whatsoever. Did you know where the bomb was intended for? No, he never told me. I never had any knowledge of that. How much money was paid for bringing that bomb in? He would have been paid a couple of thousand pounds for that. Mount Vernon's commanding officer was once again saving lives, but by thwarting the Monaghan bombing, he was in real danger of being exposed as an informer. At this stage, Michael Rath claims that individuals within Special Branch deliberately leaked information about one of his CID agents in order to divert UVF suspicions away from Agent Alice. He says the agent they sacrificed was the weapons quartermaster of Mount Vernon. Codenamed Agent Mechanic, he had originally been asked by the unit to carry out the Monaghan bombing along with Agent Alice. Who compromised Agent Mechanic? I would say other members of the UVF who were special branch agents compromised them. Where does come into this? 
Well, mechanic was going to be sacrificed because was more value to the special branch than agent mechanic. Were you surprised that these people were going to such lengths to protect? Absolutely. They should have been in jail instead of being protected. But I had no control over that. Other people were making sure he was being kept right. Terrified for his safety, Agent Mechanic contacted Trevor McElrath and Johnston Brown and asked them to help him get out of Northern Ireland. In return for safe passage to England, he brought them UVF rifles and explosives. This is the area of the motorway where Agent Mechanic left a hold all bag filled with power gel. The blue sign on the motorway is near where he left the, the power gel explosives. There was quite a quantity of it and also an assault rifle and ammunition. Spotlight has obtained a copy of the handwritten receipt for £8,000 paid to Agent Mechanic in exchange for those weapons. It's signed by Michael Rath. Despite the alleged protection of Agent Alice, he did end up in prison. Ironically, after evading prosecution for murder and attempted murder, he was convicted for his part in a brawl between two rival loyalist factions. According to Trevor McElrath, Agent Alice, while in prison, ordered the murder of a young man, Raymond McCord. The 22-year-old was on bail for drugs-related charges when he was beaten to death and his body dumped in a quarry. His father, Raymond McCord Sr., was determined to find out who had murdered his son. According to Michael Rath, Agent Alice ordered McCord's killing in order to protect the agent's drug empire. Spotlight has learned that another UVF special branch informer was present at the murder. Trevor Michael Rath says that shortly afterwards, Raymond McCord's father came to visit him. He asked me one question. Could you please tell me who murdered my son? Now, I didn't tell him the detail of the murder, but I did tell him who ordered the murder. It was none other than Mr. Raymond McCord took that information to the Ombudsman. Today, it is at the heart of her investigation into allegations that police protected UVF informers from prosecution. Since then, Michael Rath says audio recordings that were available to senior officers have been passed on to the Ombudsman. In 2000, Michael Rath retired through ill health, unable to accept that an agent he believed to be a killer had never been brought to justice and troubled by the violence he'd seen as a police officer. Something that haunts me. I have nightmares about it. I wake up and there's dead bodies in my bed. And I know that loads of other police officers suffer exactly the same. In other words, you relive the trauma every time somebody's murdered. Three years later, Trevor McElrath is still living under severe threat from Mount Vernon UVF. He has been warned that an attack is imminent. You know, I've interviewed both sides in Castle Ray, both Republican and Loyalists, and the one's just a mirror image of the other. If you grew up... While Spotlight was filming with Michael Rath in Mount Vernon, the UVF delivered a warning. Men attempted to block our car in and then pursued us out of the estate. Just get out, quick. Quick. Don't stop at the lights. But Trevor McElrath faces a new threat. The Ombudsman now wants to interview him about his handling of informants, in particular Agent Alice. Under investigation are allegations that police handlers assisted offenders and perverted the course of justice. Did you knowingly mishandle this agent? Never at any time did I mishandle any agent. We had 28 registered informants. All of them were handled properly. You never crossed the line with Ever crossed the line. I wouldn't do that.
They wouldn't do that. Despite giving Spotlight this interview, Michael Rath is refusing to cooperate with the Ombudsman, who he says wants to interview him under police caution. Can you understand why, by refusing to cooperate directly with the Ombudsman, some people might infer that you're acting like a man who has something to hide? I can understand people thinking that, but then, you see, the, had I not been treated like a criminal, had I been treated and asked to be a witness and been well enough to go, bear in mind, I'm not, you know, I'm not well and I know I'm not well. Michael Rath was forced to retire due to serious health problems, including depression. The Ombudsman is investigating a number of the special branch officers whom Michael Rath believes protected Agent Alice from prosecution. However, the Ombudsman also wants to interview several CID officers, including Trevor Michael Rath. He is adamant that his conscience is clear. I know in my heart, I can put my hand on my heart and say that I know that I did nothing wrong. But Spotlight can reveal that 15 years ago, before Agent Alice was being jointly handled by Special Branch, Trevor Michael Rath may have had good reason to believe that his agent had tried to kill. Late one evening in the spring of 1991, an attempt was made to murder a Catholic man at White Abbey Hospital. The man is still fearful for his safety. In an interview which we have reconstructed, he says he grappled with his would-be killer. I went for the weapon, and I got it, and him. So the two of us went onto the ground, both of us on our knees. I could see this guy. I looked in his eyes. I could smell his breath. That's how close I was to him. The man has told us that he gave police a detailed description of his attacker, which matched that of Agent Alice in the early 90s. I told him he had black hair, black moustache, and that he was well built. I told him that he had a tattoo on his arm. When we first spoke to Trevor McElrath, he told us that he was actually in the police incident room when his agent's details flashed up on screens. But I remember them talking about and about his tattoo and about uh, his details had come up in the computer for that the mur attempted murder of Mr. If that is what happened, then Trevor Michael Rath should have known that his agent was a potential killer months before Special Branch started to run him with CID. However, in a later interview, Michael Rath, who is on medication, said he had been confused and told us he didn't know why Agent Alice's details were on the screen that night. The incident is now under investigation by the police ombudsman. At issue in all of these murders is whether loyalist agents were allowed to kill while being actively protected by individuals within the police. In response to the allegations, the PSNI said in a statement that it is widely recognised as having implemented significant reforms to the way it handles intelligence and informants and is subject to oversight and scrutiny from a range of public bodies. That, it said, should never take away from the fact that for over 35 years, dedicated and professional CID and special branch officers saved lives and averted serious injury. It said while a police ombudsman investigation is ongoing, it would not be appropriate to comment in any further detail. What is clear is that running agents within paramilitaries here is a legal and moral minefield. You say you were told to do your job, but surely... You should have walked away. If I had walked away, he would have killed more people. I was good at my job. Had he not have had the protection of special branch, I would have put him in jail. But to walk away wouldn't solve the problem.